the problem is you you can't schedule that 20 percent inspiration time totally it's not going to say oh you show up at this time you have to get in there in the morning stay there all day and work at it to be able to be be there be prepared for when it does show up you know inspiration is a huge thing for me at least understanding it trying to figure out what I can do to make it more likely to show up because the best stuff comes when you're truly deeply in the zone. I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. Prestige Living Podcast. So with that, who do you want to be? Hello! Welcome to the Prestige Living Podcast, where we bring you the difference makers and thought leaders from your backyard in L.A. and Orange County. I'm your host today, Kane German, and today's episode is ridiculously special, man. I can't even begin to tell you how special it is, and it's really, to me, it's a super, how would I say, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with our guest today. Um, This gentleman comes all the way from Northridge. I should say I come from all the way from Northridge. I drove all the way up here to be here because it's super awesome. Um, but he's a gnarly accomplished music composer who has worked on games such as StarCraft, Diablo, World of Warcraft, recently Overwatch, and Revelation Online, which he just recently won an award for. He also does he uh, did the TV series such as Stargate SG-1, Stargate Atlantis, Witchblade, Sanctuary, and has scored over 30 feature films. And I'm super stoked to be with him today. Again, an honor and sincere pleasure. I give you all Mr. Neil Acri. Hey! hey. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Neil. Thanks, and thanks for driving all the way up here. Of course, man. Of course. It's cool to be here. Um, just to set the scene, I'm in his studio right now, which I will call a pretty sweet lair. Um, there's a life-size Han Solo Carbonite to my right, and a life-size Storm Trooper chicken chilling on the couch to my left, and a pair of guitars right in front of me. Well, Neil's right in front of me, but there's some guitars. So, Neil... How'd you get started with the music biz, man? How did you know that this was what you wanted to do? And really, tell us a story. Well, I didn't start out wanting to be a, a composer, but uh, in in high school, I was actually uh, planned on being an artist, a graphic artist, and and that's you know what my my dad was an amazing artist, and I enjoyed doing that, so I figured that's what I was going to do with my life. And then in high school, I started uh, playing guitar, and you know, got in a rock band like a lot of people do, and um, that kind of started taking over. So when I started in, in college, I was taking you know the majority of, of art classes with one music class on the side. By the second semester, it was all music classes and one art class on the side. Music just took over. So you've always been in the arts? Yeah. How did, how did your dad feel when he's like, hey, man, you're deviating from me, and then you're kind of doing your own thing in music? Well, he, he was uh, you know an incredible artist and... Uh, musician as well he played a bunch of different instruments celtic instruments like the you know, fiddle and celtic harp and dulcimer and, and a bunch of these uh instruments so i was surrounded by that growing up but uh professionally he was uh, ended up working in the automotive industry because you know he had to get a job to support the family and i think i kind of grew up with that feeling of if you if you don't do what you want if you don't do what you love in life you're going to end up regretting it so Ever since then, I've been kind of just doing what what makes me happy. So you did that right away when you started playing guitar? It's like, dude, this makes me happy. I'm going to do it forever. Yeah. I mean, again, when I started out playing guitar, I just, it kind of was like a side thing. And I actually thought, you know, art would be a more practical career. And it, at, at the time, you know, uh, playing guitar in a band meant, hey, if you want to be successful, then you have to be in a band, you know, a, a successful band that gets famous and, and you sell a million albums and you know tour the world and all that kind of thing so you know it's kind of it didn't occur to me at the time that there are more practical ways to make a living as a musician or as a composer or songwriter and, and it kind of it was at the, the the moment when I realized that there are people that do this for a living that aren't necessarily uh, you know Metallica or some famous band that you know that's in the world uh, the composers they, they're rock stars in their own right but they're people that are just you know they go into work every day and they you know make music and, and that's that's a career and there was a point when I was in college I had a, a professor that was a, a studio musician for a lot of session player uh, like for a lot of composers like John Debney and Shirley Walker and he taught me uh, one that pretty much how to technically 
uh, compose how to synchronize music to picture and things like that. And they took me to a bunch of sessions, and I got to see firsthand that this is, you know, this is a real job. People do this, and no, it's not easy. And you know, he discouraged me from even trying to to do it to a certain degree. But I think he wanted to test me and, and make sure that I was really serious about it. Got it. Got it. So at what at what point in your college career, um, you said when you're doing doing the music stuff, were you like, cool. Guitar is one thing, but you started realizing all these other avenues. And what what point did you realize that that's the avenue I want to go to? I mean, I feel like that's almost similar to what I had. I was growing up to like listening to Symphony X, um, Symphony X, Dream Theater, Steve Vai, crap ton of Steve Vai. I wanted to be the next Steve Vai. Mm-hmm. And then it was Me like, too. holy moly, dude! Like listening to Symphony X, and you know how dark it is, and like Danny Elfman, John Williams, stuff like that. Is like these aren't like stock scores. These are not old stuff that Mahler wrote and stuff like mm. that. It's like people are writing these custom for these films and stuff like that. So that's when I realized it. So when did you realize that? And when did you realize that that was the ticket, that was your avenue? Well, the the, the path started in high school. I, I you know started listening to like Def Leppard and Bon Jovi, Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction came out and it's kind of like the start of that, that whole scene. And then I, you know, wanted, was looking for heavier and heavier music, you know, I turned into Metallica, turned into Slayer, turned yes. into Death, and you know, yes. Carcass, and like all yes. these you know crazy bands. And at some point, I realized you can only like you know drop tune so far. You can only play so loud, and and you know, heavy music sort of there's there's a limit to what you can do with it. And at some point, I started realizing you can expand either the palette and adding orchestra for example i started you know hearing some some things like stravinsky's ride of spring is like one of the heaviest pieces ever written and yep. there's no guitar in it at all yep so the idea of of you know kind of building on this and and you know expanding the palette beyond just the you know typical band uh it was really exciting so i would use uh you know synthesizers and whatever whatever sounds i could find whether it was uh you know some of my dad's instruments and and alternate the uh you know like manipulate the pitch or just try different things just whatever i could to kind of create these soundscapes and and that was like the the, the really exciting and i and i started making instrumental music and people kept saying oh that should be in a movie and i always thought oh thanks but you know you don't really think hey i should do that and again it, i was you know in college and this uh this teacher of mine took me to these sessions and there was a point where i thought you know, I really could. This is actually a career. I really could do this. And it, it. I asked him, "Do you think I, I have what it takes to be a composer?" And he said, "No." Oh crap! <laughs> and um, and again, I later I realized that that he was just testing me, and trying to make sure that I wanted to do it no matter what. And and I and I did. And I it it occurred to me that I would rather. Try try this and fail at it, then do anything else. And I haven't looked back since. Good, good. All right, so I want to hit that. That I want to get onto that later. Um, it's funny you say that about the um, you can't tune lower anymore because everyone's doing like eight string guitars, dropping mm-hmm. the F sharp down to E. So it's like imagine imagine that happening twenty years ago. It's like yeah, dude, who's gonna tune to uh, E of an octave down? Now there's bands that are doing it even heavier and like slower, and it's like. Mm-hmm. It's getting a little ridiculous, but I get what you mean. Yeah. Okay, so so you're transitioning from guitar, and you realize that this is an avenue for you, and like, oh, crap, these colors are actually really cool, just like Stravinsky did it in Rite of Spring, and Debussy did it with Lemaire and all his Impressionist stuff, like these real unique colors, and you realize that this is what really excites you. How did you start getting gigs? I mean, everybody told you, it's like, all right, so this is, this is cool. This should be in a movie, and you're like, okay, at what point, or how did you start getting gigs and start using your musical uh, talent to start, you know, doing it in films. Yeah, well, well, that's that's always the the tricky part. I started doing short films. Um, you know, I found well, the first thing I did was actually a movie that I made myself with friends, and I started it and I uh, edited it and did everything, and it was you know shot at Pierce College and. Um, it was a slasher film where the the killer you know used a butter knife to kill people. Stupidest thing in the world, but it was a chance to actually score something, and and that was like my first real world experience. And I also I uh, rescored the movie The Usual Suspects because I liked the score and I liked the movie. At, at the time, it seemed like 
this would be a good way to to test my abilities, also to show other people that I could do this. Mm-hmm. And because if you're if you're trying to get uh, you know your first gig and nobody has any idea what you do, all you have you know to offer is hey hey I'll do this for free, so you're not you can't lose anything. But at least this way I was able to say, not only are you getting this for free and you're not going to lose anything, but you know this, this is what I've done. This is what I've done. So you know was able to do a couple things that you know kind of could prove that I could actually do it and also kind of taught me how to do it got got some a little bit of early training um, so st- student films uh, there was some publications this is before the you know not before the internet but it was like wasn't quite the same as, as it is now but you know there's like uh, a couple magazines called backstage west or drama log where you'd in the back they had a, a uh, listings for actors or even uh, every once in a while a composer and so I did a couple through that or went to uh, like AFI and different film schools and, and just asked around put up flyers and offered you know to, to score their films and I did a few once I had done a few of those and I had a demo reel together then uh, you know opportunities started to pop up you know for paid gigs and I did a, an animated series for the what was called the Fox Family Channel at the time is I don't think it's around anymore but um, so just that kind of led to little things you just kind of you put yourself out there in the world and and people become aware of what you're doing and then all of a sudden they start to meet you halfway people start to come to find you while you're pushing yourself out there in the world and then um, the real break was uh, I was finishing up school and uh, summer summer came and I needed uh, just a day job and the uh, somebody there offered me a chance to work in Cartage which is uh, setting up musical equipment at recording sessions which is like that's basically awesome. it's like glorified moving so mm, not not I necessarily say that's cool man that's super rad but it was one of those things like I, I I'd had the opportunity to do it before and, and I didn't because I figured I don't want you know that's not really the best way to enter the business but at the same time, I didn't realize it until I started. Like within the first couple of days, I, I had met like some of my biggest heroes: James Horner, uh, Jerry Goldsmith. You know that led to, to meeting Joel Goldsmith, Jerry's son, who uh, I worked with for many years. He uh, he gave me a lot of amazing opportunities. <clears throat> so I started. I met him through that cartage job, uh, which the other great thing about that is I got to go while setting up the equipment for for studios. Uh, at studios for composers, uh, I'd get to sit in and watch the recording session go down. So I'd get to see, you know, like Titanic and, you know, all these huge movies uh, get recorded and watch how the sessions were run. And, you know, I learned so much there. And again, I was, I was the moving guy. I was the guy that after the session, you know, I'd go and drag these heavy racks of equipment out. And, but it was, it was the best. And I, I, couldn't have imagined at the time that that was, you know, that would be such a great opportunity. That's what I was going to say. Looking back on it in hindsight, you don't re- probably realize, like, this is going to be the bee's knees. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're probably like, grab this, I'm better than this, and blah, blah, blah. But you got to sit as a fly on a wall. That's yeah. super cool. Super cool. So, to recap, you would pretty much did work for free, right? Yeah. I feel like there's no difference to that now. Like, everyone yeah. has to do it for free. There's yeah. the, the catch-22. You know what I mean? Um and eventually, you just worked yourself up until we pe- people knew who you were. Like, oh shit, Neil Aker does really good stuff. Let's get him on. And then they do, they're also dumb and dumb. And they're like, pick him up, pick him up. Well, so, so the real, the real shift. What I was starting to say is, um, working for Joel Goldsmith. He's an established composer, mm-hmm. working on the Stargate series at the time, and doing. You know, I've done a bunch of films, and I not only learned a lot working for him, but you know. He he worked so much that he had overflow work. Everyone does, you know. Just you take on so much that you you, you don't want to turn gigs down because you turn a gig down, the person that's hiring you is probably going to find someone else, and they're probably going to love what that person does and never call you again. Mm-hmm. That's the fear. I mean, it it can be unreasonable at times, but it's happened enough to me that I I am always reluctant to turn anything down because you know that could happen. Yeah. So so. Joel had enough work that he was able to give me a little bit on the side. He had me do a cue here and here and there. Um, you know, he did had a film. Uh, someone offered him a film, and and he he wrote the theme and had me do the score. That was my first film, um, and then you know started writing more and more in the Stargate series. Then Stargate Atlantis came along, and then he's doing two series and then movies and and 
just way too much for one person to do. So I just started working more and more, and all of which I'm getting paid for. And at some point, you know, the the, the you know you start to the bird, you know, you start to fly on your own. You start it's you nice. step away and start to fly on your own. And, and and Joel was always very supportive of that. And and uh, the first movie I did with him led to seven more movies for that director and then the producer of each of those movies wanted me for something else so almost all the 30 films i've done came from that one first film i could trace them all back you know to that one first film that joel had basically handed me dude that is super cool and did he guide you along the way when you were kind of like writing cues for him was he like hey you might want to try this to kind of make it seem um like it's still the same people talking was it neil agri taking the credit or was it joel goldsmith in like in a like a remote control kind of sense where it's like Hans Zimmer writes a theme sends it off to somebody else a little of both I mean early on it was kind of he was his name on it but then by towards the end of the Stargate series I was a co-composer credited co-composer on the series so he was he was very supportive and uh you know had a lot of great advice um kind of you know I working for someone else you get to see Everyone has a different way of working. And getting to work for someone else that has mm-hmm. really established their style and their their uh, workflow, it's a great way to to pick up the things you like about their process and and you know avoid the things you don't like. And mm-hmm. I've worked for a few different people and, and gotten to kind of pick and choose the things about their process that I like and kind of you come up with your own along the way. Awesome. And what's like the biggest takeaway you would say you got from Joel? Um. He's a very practical composer, like just kind of in terms of how he created the music, you know, he would, uh, you know, sit down in front of the the, the picture, um, you know, watch the show, kind of play along, uh, record and build the music as he went using the orchestra samples and stuff, which is a lot of people do it that way. But, you know, at the time it was, you know, you didn't have... Uh, there was a couple classes you could take. There was one out of date book, but there wasn't like as, as nearly as many resources in, in terms of how to how to do it. He also taught me how to um, I, I perform with a volume pedal. I don't know how technical you want to get with this stuff. I, I, no, I actually saw that. Yeah. Like I, I figured one of them was like an expression pedal, and then... I have both. I have I use two pedals. A right pedal is a volume pedal. Left pedal is an expression pedal. So everything I I play it with two hands while my feet are kind of controlling the dynamics and the expression of the music and something I got from him because uh, working in TV you have to create you know very fully polished orchestrated mock-ups that are broadcast ready in a very short time Mm -hmm. so every everything you can do to streamline that process to get as much expression out of every instrument the better because it has to sound real working on a show like Stargate the is based on the movie Stargate and the movie Stargate had a huge orchestra and mm-hmm. the TV show, most of the time we had the budget maybe for one or two soloists, but it was mostly huge symphonic <coughs> sound, but using samples, you know, libraries. Using samples. So, so you're pretty much inserting all the expression data as you're playing it versus yeah. like what I would do is just like mod wheel stuff and then edit the envelope later. Yeah, and I do a little bit of that too, but it's, it's mostly played in as I go because... Uh, it just, it's for me. It's more natural. Like I, I would, I would used to draw in the little, you know, draw in the lines and everything, and you have like a very robotic ramp up and stuff. But there's something about playing it. Once you get in the flow of it, you're able to kind of emulate the sound of the instrument a little better. Yeah, you're actually playing the instrument versus programming the instrument yeah. inside, and that's what you picked up from Joel in terms of practicality. That was a huge, extra yeah, line. that was a huge thing. Yeah. That's awesome, awesome. So you're you're segueing from TV and movies, and how did you come into to Blizzard? How did that happen? That was ten years ago, last Thursday. Strangely enough, that that I high five, huh? high five, all high right, five. High five. it's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, this, I, I had just noticed that that the sort of the anniversary was of me sending the demo to them, and it was I was kind of like a right place at the right time kind of thing where my agent at the time asked me, "Hey, would you be interested in writing for games?" And I said, "Yeah, absolutely." I you know I hadn't set out to do that, but it seemed like a great opportunity. I love playing games, and and you know. Was totally into the idea. So but, that was your, your first. That Blizzard was your first game gig. Yeah, and you were doing films. All the, yeah. Dude. So I was a co-composer on Stargate at the time. I had done twenty films, um, but my agent had 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 done a favor for Blizzard. It's it's kind of a long story, but he had done a favor, and they said, "Hey, thank you. Um, 
if you have anyone in your roster you'd like us to listen to, we'll, we'll do that. And they did. My demo happened to be right in line with what they were looking for at the time for the next WoW expansion. And they they had me do an audition. So I didn't even know what I was auditioning for, but they had me rescore one of the World of Warcraft cinematics, <clears throat> which I did. There was no sound uh, or reference of any kind. They just said, here, just rescore this. And naturally, I did a little bit of research to kind of get a feel for what the franchise sounded like. But um, there wasn't that much to go off of. So anyways, what I, I wrote and I sent it off. That was 10 years ago and got the gig. Uh, and that led to, you know, 10 years of, of great stuff with Blizzard. And, and that was the start of the of my game career. That's awesome. Do you mind disclosing which cinematic it was? It was the Burning Crusade cinematic. The one I told you was my favorite one? Yeah. Dude, jeez Louise. And is the the one the, the piece you sent for the audition the one that they used for the final? No. No, it was... I, I scored the, uh, the... It was one of the original World of Warcraft uh, cinematics. And then... Once I got the gig, then they sent me the Burning Crusade cinematic, which I scored. There's still a little bit of DNA in there of, of what I did because I had basically my the piece I wrote was sort of a conceptual piece and, and me kind of saying this is how I interpret the music I've heard so far from WoW. So there is a tiny bit in there. Good. So when you pitched that audition, did you pitch it to them personally or you just handed it to your agent and your agent said, here's Neil Acri. Sent, I sent them, uh, my agent had, there was, there was very little direct interaction. Uh, my agent had sent them a, a demo, uh, a general demo with all of my stuff that I had, I had put together kind of based on what I, w- what I was familiar with the, the franchise, what I thought might kind of fit within that. And then um, when I, I wrote the custom demos, again, it was um, kind of tailored towards what I thought, my interpretation of what that the sound of their franchise was and then sent that to, to the agent who sent it to them and and then waited you know two or three months and um you know i think during that time i met jason hayes and Dude. uh i think i asked him you know at the t- he i don't think he was at blizzard at the time and i asked him uh any advice on you know i sent this demo or anything and he said yeah, it's kind of in the hands of the directors and you know there's not much you can do so I just I just waited and, and eventually got the call and you know that's cool man that's super cool would yeah. you ever think like when you first started that you'd be working in games is that the plan to work in film the whole time just like I feel like that, that was, was the- that was the original plan I mean I started out you know as a film composer and I still do films and I still love the art form mm-hmm. but the door opened into games and you know I've loved games my whole life so it wasn't in retrospect, it was it was a natural path, but I, I just didn't realize it at the time. And going back to having the resilience to do it, how did you? I mean, I'm sure there had to be some creative slash cognitive um, um, barriers that you had to overcome. It's like, oh, dude, I'm stepping into this world of, of film, which is usually you have your your John Williams, your John Debney, your 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 Powell, your Hans Zimmer. How did you ever feel like, oh man, I'm never going to be able to be these dudes? And I feel like everybody does has that. Every creative professional has that. I, I think I might have been at an advantage because I was stepping into a world that um, that I wasn't a part of, and I was I knew all I could do is be myself. It wasn't going to do me any good to try to copy anyone else. So while I was familiar with the music that had come before in that franchise, I wrote my own voice because that's that's all I could do. Mm-hmm. And I think I did some research at the time, listened to some other game music, and especially after this, after that that first cinematic happened, I, I you know, was kind of curious what other avenues I could find in, in the industry. Listened to a lot of music, and there's a lot of great stuff happening, but it was all... I, I realized going in and trying to copy and sound like everyone else wasn't going to do me any good. <clears throat> so I sort of felt like if I'm able to go in there with my own voice and and you know make something happen with that that that's all I could really do got it and I remember you said you're you're not formally trained you had like some stuff with (coughs) it's okay but you said um I remember you said you weren't formally trained and you felt like the lack of a of a consistent constant and structure kind of allowed you to form your own voice and how what how do you feel you formed your own voice but like what music did you listen to what what 
idioms did you take away from each genre? Like, what do you feel Neil Lagree is? Good question. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say... I, I would say that I um, kind of formed my own voice because I had to, because I didn't have you know, the formal uh, university training that where people are kind of like, oh, you have to listen to this and you have to do this and, and all that. And, um, you know, if I had to go back and do it over again, I, you know, I might, I might go down that route, that route. But um, I, I, I do feel like having had to figure things out, a lot of stuff on my own, um, it, it is a big part of who I am. And uh, that might, might have put certain limitations on 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 what I'm able to do, but it also kind of it definitely helped define the sound that I have. So what I, I listen to a lot of film music, and then I also I remember Danny Elfman once saying, um, "Don't listen to just to your favorite composers for inspiration. Listen to the composers that inspired them." So that yep. you know, I started listening to a lot of Bernard Herrmann, you know, because he's Herman. the one that influenced Danny Elfman. And so, you know, uh, I love John Williams, and he was influenced by Corn Gold. Gold. And, all the Hollywood, all the Golden Era guys. Yeah, so I started listening to a lot of that stuff and, and kind of getting, you know, that was my education, just listening to a lot of music. And, you know, I have a, a decent ear, which is kind of how I find everything I do. It's kind of my ear finding its way towards what ult- the ultimate sound I'm going for. Very organically artistic. Yeah. I dig that. I dig that. So developing, what about developing all this stuff? You talked about your creative stuff and getting gigs, but and you mentioned your agent. And before your agent, how did you get all this business other than the people were calling you to do things? Did you have any contracts in place? Were you kind of a stickler about that? I mean, how did you handle everything? You handle everything yourself? Did you have, um, I remember we talked about a PR firm earlier. Did you have any, anything like that before, marketing? Um, well, all of the above was was pretty much me and that I think a lot of composers you kind of have to be your own agent PR person uh, lawyer all the stuff early on um, yeah. so yeah getting gigs um, yeah, I, I got a lot of things through Joel which was great um, and then a lot of stuff that you know based on as I started to do get my own films um, you know there a lot of that was just kind of networking and you know the people that I did one film with it would always lead to other relationships and other films and then kind of continue to you know form those relationships contract wise um, <clears throat> you know I I did my best to educate myself early on about the basics of contract law and you know there's there's not a lot of leeway you know, unfortunately, with work for hire, you know they're pretty. The contracts are pretty standard, and you can ask for more money, and you know, ninety nine percent of the time they'll say no, or mm-hmm. maybe they'll give you a little more, uh, or you'll, um, you know, if it's very little up front, you can ask for you can make it a license deal where you're licensing the music for a, a short time, uh, but you actually retain the ownership because they're not paying for it up front mm-hmm. as much. Um, but these are all things that I kind of had to figure out on my own early on. <coughs> and, and the licensing versus uh, full rights, how, how common was the licensing? Because I feel like anytime now, it's like, do we, we own the full rights, but they don't want to pay for the full rights. Mm. You know what I mean? How does that work? Like, yeah. How was that back then? Um, that happened fairly often, but a lot of the stuff, the majority of the stuff I've done has been work for hire, which is pretty standard in the industry. And, you know, I... If they pay a, a standard rate up front, a fairly industry common rate up front, you know, there's not much you can do about it if you're not in a position. If you're not, if you're John Williams or Hans Zimmer or someone like that, you're you can demand a certain, you know, uh, premium for what you do. But if you're kind of in in the out there in the sea of all the other composers, it's difficult to really. It, it, it depends on the project. It depends on the people. Making the film, making the game. How how much do they care about music? Do they care, or do they care about getting the project done uh, within the budget? Which is most most often the case. They, the, you know, I can say, hey, but I can I can I'm going to work harder than anyone else could. I'm going to give you the best music possible. But you know, ultimately, all they care about is it getting done w- within this budget. So it doesn't really matter. I guess it 
kind of happens to be in the hand of the developer how much they actually value it because now since I feel like composing for video games has, has exponentially like how would you say it? increased like as a, as a job desire like everyone's willing to undercut each other and like you said earlier like working for free was a thing then and now it's even probably even more so because everyone wants to do it so we many have, more composers now than there were totally but I, I, I blame that I don't say blame because it's not a bad connotation but you have ex way more accessibility to music software, hardware, um, way more, I guess, marketing available with your social media um, and whatnot. It's like everyone wants to do it. So how did, how have you combated that? Like, the, I don't want to say devaluation of music, but like, how do you continually stick out from the crowd? How do you continually let people know why they should pay you other than you being Neil Akery and your serious, awesome rap sheet? Well, it's... Uh that's a great question, but I'll, I'll tell you, like, you know, when you say, and I, I love, I love hearing you say, you know, the, oh, oh, you're Neil Akery and this and that, but um, I, I, to this day, I don't really think of myself as, as, you know, whatever you're you're referring to Neil Akery as being this entity of, you know, a certain degree of success. I've never thought of myself as that. I just, I'm just still the kid that. You know, trying to do the best music I can and try to work on fun projects. And, you know, from the very beginning, that was always my goal and it still is to this day. So all of the, the percept, the outside perception of success is, is, is on the outside. It's how people view, uh, you know, what I do. There's a certain amount of PR involved. You, you obviously you try to put yourself out there and try to share your accomplishments with people in the hopes that it will lead to new projects, bigger projects, better projects. But ultimately, I don't think a lot about that. And ultimately, I try to be. Uh, I just try to make the best music I can. And I, I, the relationships I have with with developers and people that continue to hire me, they continue to do so because they know I'm reliable. They know I work really hard. They know I put all of myself into everything I do, and they and they appreciate that. And I'm easy to work with because I know the last thing they want to deal with, with all the other things they have to deal with, is somebody uh, with a diva or someone that's, you know, uh, a pain in the ass. So I'm trying. I try to be as easy to work with as possible. That's just my personality, but I think that it pays off because, you know, if you're if you're able to deliver a good product, a quality product, and um, make it as simple as possible for the person that's hiring you to, to get that, then they're going to keep coming back for it. Then for sure you're a true artist. Like, mm -hmm. it's all about the art, the end result there, and kind of forget about ego yeah. there. I, I'd be doing this if I wasn't getting paid for it. I feel like that's what <laughs> it should be. It should be. You know it, I mean? it has to be. And Absolutely. And that's that's actually... It's funny because we keep talking about doing the work for free, and it's funny how every story... Of, of a guy who's kind of made it quote unquote um, did that for a long time and that's kind of like the tell like they did work for free and they're doing it even if they weren't getting paid for mm -hmm. it so and eventually because it, they did that and the, exactly like you said you had all these relationships and people became more aware of what you were doing and it's like it finally led to you I mean the monetization part that's yeah. awesome that's cool um, so kind of Segwaying with that stuff in mind, what what do you think the single biggest mistake done by composers? I mean, in terms of prospecting, finding work, networking, um, the work and the production itself. No biggest mistake. Um, you know, definitely taking yourself too seriously is is not. It's never a good idea. You know. Um, or like I said about just you know being a diva, being difficult to work with because n nobody wants to work with someone that's um, not flexible or that's uh, you know there are I've heard stories about major Hollywood film composers like top top composers that don't get any more work because they're you know just difficult to work with or you know things got too complicated or they're you know I, I think. It's the same as any profession, you know. Like, I don't want to equate composing to plumbing, but if you want to, if you want a good plumber, the first place you're going to ask is you're going to ask your friends. Hey, you know, a good plumber, mm -hmm. and you're going to you're going to want someone that's reasonably priced, but that does a really good job, and is easy to work with. Not going to, you know, 
not going to be a pain in the ass. And ultimately, if, if they do a good job, you're going to call them again. You're going to recommend them to your friends. Unfortunately, it is. I don't want to take the art and the mystery out of composing, but basically, this is a you know, it's a, it's a service based industry. We are servicing the needs of the of the client. We are creating music for their project. We're helping them realize their creative vision. Sometimes it gets very artsy and lofty and 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 all that, and that's great. But ultimately, you know, you're working with people who want who want to who are trying to create something, and you're helping them create something. So the easier it is for them to do that with your help, the the more likely they are to work with you. Again, I think that's an important thing for sure. Okay, right on. And in terms of like, nego- I have it written down right here, negotiation, but like rate negotiation, and you just said. And feel like you already answered. Just be, be as easy as possible, because you're trying to help people, like their vision to fruition. Yeah, okay. well, rate rate negotiation is tricky because you have to be, you have to value yourself. You have to know uh, how much. First of all, factor in how much time it's going to take you to do the job. How much, um, you know, you have overhead, you have electrical bills, and you have equipment you need to buy to complete the project. You don't want to be coming out. Uh, you know, in the negative at the end, uh, but you have to put a value on yourself and your and your abilities, and it's tricky to do because the the music does continue to get devalued, um, especially as the industry changes, as you know, with piracy and with all the competition, and you know the you know film, for example, uh, the middle budget films. You know, of of, uh, of ten years ago, are no more. Now it's super low budget or super high budget. And so why do you think that's so? That was because the uh, the economic collapse in two thousand eight. Um, basically, people that used to invest some of their extra cash in, into film productions, you know, sort of as a vanity thing, or just maybe, hey, I want to get into movies, or they actually thought they were maybe they were getting money back from them. Uh, in two thousand eight, with that economic collapse everyone was like you know holding on to their money a lot more closely so those kind of you know the investors that made those middle budget movies happen uh dried up and so the industry kind of it became a lot more dangerous for studios to make middle budget movies they're either gonna you do your your guaranteed success tentpole movies or super low budget movies that they they know they can sell for you know they know how much they're going to get for them, so they know how much they're going to they're going to put in. And it's usually like the one to five million dollar budget movies. Do you feel that's the same with music? Like it's either like the guys who are playing in big arenas or the guys who are playing small shops. There's no like middle ground anymore. Yeah, and, yeah, probably. And, and and I ask that because like we said earlier, like the accessibility of hardware, software, marketing, but also distribution. You got iTunes, Spotify, YouTube is huge. Things like that, like. How how have you managed to change your workflow and and, and your your creative business to kind of <clears throat> flow with the new changes? Like we're we're technically challenging all these paradigms like that we used to know like ten years ago. You know what I mean? And that kind of not devalued music, but it made it way more accessible and convoluted the market. Yeah, how did you? It's tricky. That? Um, YouTube, for example, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, the World of Warcraft music. Every time an expansion comes out, <clears throat> there are embedded music files in in the soundtrack that come. Basically, the the software for the game has even like in the the early beta versions. So the game's not even out, and this uh, early version of the game has music embedded in it. People have figured out how to extract that music and uh, put it up on they put it up on YouTube because they're excited about the music they want to share it they want other people who aren't able to extract it like them to hear it <coughs> and this is a blessing and a curse because uh, more people are get to hear the music uh, but it's also it, it, nobody asks if they have permission to do it uh, so the music ends up getting shared across thousands of different pages. It gets recently. I did a piece called Anduin for the upcoming Legion expansion. Uh, you know, 
two months before the game's release, someone pulls it out of the out of the beta files, puts it on YouTube. Within a week, it has a hundred thousand views. Uh, the guy putting it up I, has I heard it. <laughs> the guy putting it up has uh, you know commercial on it. He's making a few bucks. You know, not that there's much money in you know that kind of stuff. But um, the point is like. Not that I'm not saying, hey, I'm getting robbed from this, but it's it's just the 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 general cons- uh, the general misconception that the music belongs to everyone, and let's put it on YouTube, let's share it everywhere, and it's great. But nobody realizes that technically, even YouTube uh, considers that to not be a legal license of the music, because you know the person if you upload the music to YouTube and you don't own it. Then it's that you don't have the right to upload it, hmm. but everyone does it anyways. I, I will often, if I need to listen to a piece, a reference piece, I have the soundtrack sitting right over there. I'll just go to YouTube and listen to it. Everyone does it. It's easy. I'm not saying you know it, it's just it's just the easiest way to do it. I you know, sharing if I want to send someone some music to someone, I'll I'll do it that way. But there's just this general. <coughs> Kind of a, a, a general shift in how things are, are being done, how, how music's being distributed, uh, how it's being valued or not valued, and it's it's kind of it's a, it's a tricky time. It's it, it it was a tricky time several years ago. Now it's it, it's just common practice, and and I can't imagine that that changing. Though I do hope that companies like YouTube or Spotify, Pandora, all of the uh, file sharing not file sharing, but all of the uh, the, the streaming sites. Um, you know, uh, I hope that you know, performing rights organizations like ASCAP and BMI are able to, you know, figure out deals that that are able to give royalties to the artists. That this is this is our this keeps us afloat. You know, between gigs, royalties. Yeah, totally, totally. That was a that was a damn good answer. Um, I have a bunch of questions here, but I don't know if they're like good. So, <clears throat> what does a typical day look like for you? Ah, oh, good question. Um, yeah, I just uh, I you, feel like I spend a uh, way too much time answering emails and focusing on logistics and you know it's kind of mapping out like all planning everything and networking and getting all the things lined up. Once that's out of the way, and I'm able to focus and 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 I remove the clutter from my brain, then I can really focus and concentrate, and then I write some music. And that often happens late at night, which is the reason I'm such a night owl, is that during the day, you know, there's all these other things to take care of. Good. So what what morning routines do you have to kind of set yourself up for the day then? Just getting getting rid of all the, you know, business that needs to be done for the day. Um, Just like the email logistics stuff? Pretty much, yeah. It's nothing, <laughs> nothing too exciting. <clears throat> um, if the gig was easy, what would it look like? Like say say you were gonna start all over again. You didn't do anything with Joel. You didn't make any of those connections. What would you do if you had to immediately start getting gigs right away? Um, I'd probably do the same thing. I, I I don't know another way to do it. You know, I mean, just um, first of all, going out there and well, just to start from the beginning. Uh, first of all, prove to yourself and prove to people that. Could potentially hire you that you can actually do the gig. So rescoring something. If you don't have something to score, then find something to score. I remember doing you know, that stuff. It's cool. You know, because that will give you the experience and they'll give you the the demo reel. Because you know, when I rescored Usual Suspects, I would put the music I wrote onto a, a cassette tape. <laughs> back in the day, <laughs> I'm gonna make an audible note during this editing. Like, well, a cassette tape. A noun was. A <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, or then CDs as well. That's uh, I used to mail them to people, <laughs> <laughs> or a frisbee, yeah. <laughs> laser disc. Yeah. Right, but continue. You used to put a cassette tape and yeah. So I, you know, and so people could hear that I actually could write music. And um, because until until you're actually able to put something down in some form that someone can hear, uh, you're just talking. You're just saying, hey, I can do this. I can do that. And you know, I think people kind of assume. It's kind of a prerequisite that you're able to write music. If you're offering your services for something, then you know it's kind of a prerequisite that you know actually how to do it. But if they ask, "Oh, you know, what what have you worked on?" Oh, nothing. Then 
you could you at least have to give them something to to, to listen, listen to, to. Yeah, or just to, to watch you know um and and that going from there turning that into actual jobs um you know the taking each job and using it as a platform for the next job you know in, even in terms of the pr sense just you know sharing with people hey i i just worked on this job recently i love for you to check it out they hear it Maybe it has nothing to do with what they're doing on their project, or maybe they're not even working on a project. But somewhere down the line, in the back of their mind, maybe maybe something sticks with them. Mm-hmm. This has happened before. This has happened recently too, where somebody heard, you know, we're, I'm working on the Revelation game, this Chinese game, and I'm just putting it out there in the world because it's a, it's a very special project to me, and I want people to hear it. And then, you know, sending it to people that that don't even that aren't doing anything like that. And then recently, someone asked me, "Oh, let me. Uh, can you send me a copy of that? Because I think it, you know, something similar might work great for this project." And completely out of the blue, so That's just, awesome. just putting it out there in the world because you never know. You never know where the music's going to end up landing. Yeah. And yeah. how did how did you get on Revelation Online? That was um, uh, NetEase, the company that did Revelation, is the uh, is the Chinese distributor of Blizzard games. So you know, sixty percent of the world's World of Warcraft players are in China. So there's there's a huge market there for games. Gold uh, they also have their um, their own games. Um, they were they were looking for a, a kind of a cinematic composer, uh, and they went to the uh, China Film Group, which is one of the main uh, film companies in China. And they um, they were looking for a composer, and at the time, my agency had a, had a deal with them, and you know, a film deal. And that led to um, my name came up because I had two years before I had scored World of Warcraft Miss of Pandaria for Blizzard with Blizzard, mm-hmm. and um, so that led to you know it, it was a being that I had experience working on a Chinese game. I had worked on films as well. It kind of it was the it was the perfect fit, and I you know I jumped at the opportunity. It seemed like an incredible game. It's a beautiful game. A lot of great opportunities for music. Lots of wide open spaces and beautiful landscapes and and it was it's a really cool gig awesome awesome and you recently won an award i did won it won a couple awards won the uh the bso spirit which is a, a spanish uh film music um review site uh won the their jerry goldsmith award for best video game score as well as composer of the year awesome dude congrats you gotta be stoked it, it was awesome awesome um, seems like we're heading down to the to the tail end. How many projects do you take on at once? As many as they'll give me. <laughs> <laughs> What's no, the it's it, the you know I'm, I've I've worked on as many as seven at a time, but it, it's you know <laughs> that's a lot, dude. <laughs> but what happens is <coughs> projects are kind of like you know ships floating in the ocean and if you're lucky enough you're able to hop from one to the next without you know any of them crashing into each other every once in a while they do and somehow you have to just you know make it happen stay up all night for a few days and and make it happen but um you know the the schedule shift and and those seven projects you know one might get randomly pushed out by a couple months and everything works out just fine and sometimes I'm working on literally five different things in one day, jumping from one to the next, and it's crazy. But you you kind of have to do that. That's that's the the nature of being an independent contractor. And do you feel like that bleeds into your personal life because you're so immersed in these what things? What personal life? Well, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it it can be very very uh, taxing on the personal life, you know. And again, I I I haven't. I don't see my friends very often. I don't see my family very often, which is unfortunate. But uh, every once in a while, once you get through the big, uh, you know, big bunch of projects, you know, I, I had a, a two-year stretch where it was literally from like nonstop for two years, like like crazy, and then you know a couple months where there's nothing, and you know you're you end up taking you end up getting a vacation even though you don't realize you're on the vacation until after it's over. You know, you're just kind of waiting for the for something to happen, and and next thing you know, you realize, hey, I just had two week two months off, and yeah. that's great. Do you, do you take any vacations like on purpose? 
Every once in a while, yeah. Good. I mean, oftentimes, you know, I'll, I'll go out of the country a lot for conducting. I'll try to, you know, do uh, you know, events like that. I always, I love conducting, and, and it's uh, an incredible opportunity I've been able to do with Video Games Live a few times. So often my vacations involve, you know, going somewhere where, where they are going to be. And um, it kind of ends up being a work vacation. But uh, every once in a while I will get, you know, get to squeeze in a, a personal trip. Awesome. That's cool, man. That's cool. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Tim Ferriss. No? The author? Entrepreneur? No, I haven't. Okay, so he's, he's, he's one cool dude. He's super polished. Um, he's got an incredible case of OCD. Um, but he pretty much hammers in this book for our work week, the 80-20 rule, Pareto's Law. Like, have you ever heard of it? Yeah. 20, okay, cool. So what would you say, Twenty. what is your 20% of the work that brings home 80% of the bacon? I mean, I'm assuming it's TV, I mean video games right now? Yes. Awesome. That's easy. Easy piece of lemon squeezy. We're going to do lightning round. And then, I don't want to say prospecting, but your 20% of networking that gets you 80% of the gigs. How how would you handle that? How do you handle maintaining all those relationships? Like in, I would say like when I used to work in retail, we used to have a CRM that would allow us to see which customers have come in and all the information, what they bought and kind of like give us fuel to kind of contact or touch them. You know what I mean? Do you have anything like that? Well, the majority of the work I get comes from a small handful of people that are repeat customers. People that, like I said, I, I have a long-lasting relationship with because I I try to be as easy to work with as possible. I, you know, everyone knows that I'm going to give as much of myself as possible to every gig. So I have people that I worked with on a regular ba- basis. <coughs> I work with on a regular basis that I worked with for years, and. Uh, you know, the majority maintaining those relationships is is just kind of staying in contact with friends, and you know, I'm, I'm glad that those relationships have turned into friendships and they have lasted as long as they have. That's cool. That's really cool. And then I w- this is like a more technical question, but twenty percent of your your actual workflow or your 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 process that gets you eighty percent of the result. I'm assuming it's the expression and volume pedals at once. Yeah, like definitely, I, and. Another way that that 80-20 rule might apply is that um, it seems like 80% of the time I'm kind of fumbling around and trying to find something, and 20% of the time I'm genuinely inspired. Mm. So the problem is you you can't schedule that 20% inspiration time. Totally. It's not going to say, oh, you show up at this time. You have to get in there in the morning, stay there all day, and work at it to be able to be, be there and be prepared for when it does show up. Awesome. You know, inspiration is a huge thing for me. At least understanding it, trying to figure out, you know, when it's what I can do to make it more likely to show up. Because the the best stuff comes when you're truly deeply in the zone. Stuff that comes like it feels like it's coming from another dimension. Like you're just channeling it, you know, into your work. So, so you're very passion driven about this because you you mentioned multiple sides. What you want to do? Um, how do you feel passion intersected with opportunity? Other than the one. Like when you first started, when you did the film yourself, that was like a huge initiative. It's like um, Danny Elfman did it with his brother. Remember mm-hmm. how that's yeah, how he got his, yeah. his thing? What it was like uh, that one weird film, Forbidden Zone. Mm-hmm. I think it was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So how do you feel those two intersected for you? Do you feel like the the era with Joel Goldsmith was like that the opportunity and the passion intersected, and you kind of like were the fly on the wall? <coughs> that was a, a huge time in my career for sure but I, I feel like if you're if you're really if you're really passionate and you're constantly putting yourself out there and and um, putting yourself into your work that the opportunities you know you're gonna the opportunities will will come up and you're gonna intersect with them because you're just out there you know if you're driven and you're pushing as hard as you can you're gonna run into something at some point you know, and, and it just has to. Yeah, and 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 always, you know, there there's. I do feel that every time I, I have this a significant surge of putting myself out there in the world in one way or another, that things always come back like to meet me halfway, and that's that's all you can do is you just kind of put yourself out there as much as possible, meet as many people as you can because you never know. Um, Opportunities come up all the time. People, you know, 
want to have dinner and, and just talk about random things and and you never know what what that could lead to and and so I'm always open to kind of meeting new people and and talking about new prospects. Dude, that's awesome. So wrapping it up, what's next for you? What's next for you? You see yourself going back to the film stuff or hammering it away, Blizzard? I just whatever comes my way. You know, I'm not. I, I love doing films, and I, I did one recently called The Saint, based on the '60s TV series, mm-hmm. and um, uh, which sadly nobody nobody remembers anymore, but. <clears throat> Didn't Val Kilmer make a Saint movie like in '93? Yeah, about Cold and that Fusion? was that was based on the, uh, the on the '60s series. So this is a new movie based on that. Got it. Uh, so that, and then um, a uh, you know World of Warcraft Legions coming out, and doing a couple independent uh, games as well. Um, one's called Epic Tavern, which is a fantasy based uh, management RPG. Oh wait. So um, a couple of Chinese games as well. Uh, plug away, man. Plug away. Yeah. Tell us, tell us, where can we find Epic Tavern? Epic Tavern is currently working on it. But they just recently had a Kickstarter, and um, you can find it at probably Hyperkinetic Studios is, is doing it. But you can, Epic Tavern is definitely out there. Uh, at least the uh, all the information you need is out there, and the game itself is on the horizon. Awesome, awesome. What else? What up? What about that other Chinese game you were talking about? A couple Chinese games um, uh, that I I did. One called Wildfire, and I did one called Imperial Rain that came out um, in China. And the revelation is, uh, yeah, the soundtrack is out on Varez Saraband Records, and that was a uh, an incredible thing to happen because you know Varez is a it's like the top film soundtrack label. All of my favorite, you know, you look at my CD collection over there, like half the soundtracks are the Varez Sarab- have that Varez Saraband red and white you know spine on them mm-hmm. so to get a, a game soundtrack it's only the the second game soundtrack they've ever released and the first in 15 years for a, a, a game that wasn't even released in the u.s so it, it says a lot about the increasing acceptance of game music in you know the film music culture or in, in just in pop culture in, in general that's awesome dude yeah that's got to be a huge accomplishment right yeah and that's the awesome. game itself is coming out um in in Europe later this year and then uh, North America early next year. You got to be excited. Very awesome, Neil. Thank you so much for taking the time, man. Really, I I I, I can't thank you enough for this. I really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for coming out. It's my pleasure. Awesome. Well, this is the end of it. Um, I mean, there's no one else here, just Neil and I. So we're, I mean, I said thank you on the stormtrooper. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Cue the music. Dun, 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 dun. Or know someone that would be a great guest? Go to www.prestigelivingpodcast.com. We'd love to hear your story.